Good morning. Oh, you guys can do better than that, can't you? Good morning. Good morning. Just because it's the first Sunday of Lent, it doesn't mean that we have to be sad now, does it? Um, uh, it's good to see you all here today on this bright Sunday morning. Just a few announcements before we get started today. Thank you to everyone who came out on Ash Wednesday. It was a really great night. It was a very meaningful night. And what meant most to me was just having you all here for that. That was absolutely spectacular. We do have feast night tonight at 5, um, which is a good chance for you to come. You don't have to bring anything and share a meal with people with whom you would normally never get the chance to meet or eat with, probably. So come on out tonight at 5 for feast night. The women's small group has a couple copies of their book still. If, if, if you're interested in that, it's called God So Close. It is a study of the Holy Spirit. So if you haven't picked yours up yet, or if you think you'd like to be a part of the women's small group, please um, see Brenda and she will give you a copy. This morning after the anthem, the children are invited if they would like to go out to the concourse and Sister Brenda has an awesome uh, Lenten activity for you out there. So now in our worship during the season of Lent, we will observe the season in a couple of different ways, and I just want to take a moment to introduce them. Number one, it is traditional, though not very popular anymore, but traditional um, to never utter the word Alleluia, except for right then, during the season of Lent, not to speak it or not to sing it. And essentially, that's because that word, the A word, or sometimes it's the H word, um, is uh, an exuberant word. It's a, a, a joyful word, and during Lent, um, sobriety and solemnity is sort of the thing, right? Um, but I can promise you we will have lots of the A word back um, during the Easter season. So you have that to look forward to. Secondly, throughout Lent, instead of a prelude, what we will have an experience together is something that is sorely lacking from our culture as modern humans. And that is we will share a time of silence every Sunday together. Now, I want to say as we go into this first time that silence is not and has never meant noiselessness. Amen? And no matter where you go throughout all of history, there will always be noise. Wind rushes through leaves. Dogs bark, trust me. Uh, people cough. Children make their noises. Some people make noise just when they breathe, and that is okay. You shouldn't let it disturb you or make you feel like um, your silence has been ruined because Silence has more to do with stillness than with noiselessness. In fact, most of the time you don't get to hear people breathe. You don't get to hear the little sounds of children or the wind. Those little noises are not the bane of silence. They are actually the blessing of it. So then, let us, to whatever extent we can, still our thoughts and our hearts and meet our God in the shared silence of this household.
Now, if you'll stand with me, if you are able, and join me in the confession. May the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now, as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us exchange signs of peace with one another. The peace of Christ be always with you.
Yes, he did. Please join me now in the prayer for illumination. Holy God, as your word is read and interpreted today, may it help guide us through a holy Lent with repentant hearts and renewed minds through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading today narrates the most foundational memory of our life with God. It articulates the cunning and understated incongruity between our intended life with God and the life we choose because of other voices. A reading from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. This is the word of God for the people of God. fearful path for my love is often cold he will hold me fast he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so 
Christ will hold me fast. For justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast till our faith is turned. And now, if the young people would like to go out with Sister Brenda, she has something for you out in the concourse. And would everyone else please rise if you are able for the reading of the gospel. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted there forty days and forty nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, then command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and, and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple saying to him, If you are the Son of God, then throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him again, It is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and said to him, all these I will give to you if only you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil left him. And suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. I wish to preach to you this morning from the title, 
fig leaves and leisure suits. Fig leaves and leisure suits. Please pray with me. And now, the most holy and merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever tried to become someone new? Have you ever tried to sort of uh, reinvent yourself or take on... A, a new kind of identity. I used to love this show called Freaks and Geeks. Have you ever seen that? It was, it was on in the, the late 90s, and it was about this awkward kid named Sam who was just trying to survive his freshman year of high school um, sometime in the early 80s. And he had this, this crush on a girl, but, but she just didn't care. She wouldn't give him the time of day. And so what Sam decided was that he was going to reinvent himself. And he does this by buying what he thinks is the coolest outfit he can possibly find. And it is essentially a light blue velveteen jumpsuit with a super wide collar and flared bottoms and an open neck. And of course, the coup de gras was a gold chain that was hanging on his hairless chest. And then you see him walking into school just brimming with confidence because as far as he knows, this is the coolest he has ever been. And at first, everything is fine because as soon as he gets into school, he notices that, that all the students are smiling at him. But then he noticed that their smiles are not smiles of acceptance and admiration. They are those kinds of smiles that turn into laughter and mocking. Slams, Sam slowly realizes that he has made a miscalculation. The leisure suit is not cool at all. The girl thinks he's a weirdo, and now he's going to be stuck at school looking like a clown for the next seven I'd love to tell you how the episode ends, but I had to turn it off. It was just too awkward for me. It was like too real, like I had been in that exact same position before. Because I had been in that exact same position before. When I started college, for whatever reason, I had it in my head that I needed to reinvent myself, that I needed uh, to become a new sort of me. And so what I did is I went out and I bought some new clothes, just like Sam. But I was very attentive to the styles and the trends of the day. And so I, I, I bought these shirts that had these really cool logos on them. I didn't know what they meant. But they were really kind of awesome and hip, like foxes and dragons and stuff like that. And I got a, a bright yellow tech vests. The millennials in the audience know what tech vests are. And uh, to top it all off, I got a visor, which was in 2002 all the rage. So your curly hair could still stick out the top, but this was all like shaved right here. Oh, but the, the coup de grace was I grew a thin, wispy soul patch under my bottom lip, which was like 
the most awesome thing in the world in 2001. And I thought it was perfect. Transformation was complete. And you know what? It worked. I totally pulled it off. In fact, halfway through the first day, I found myself talking to the prettiest girl in my first college class. And I remember standing there thinking like, I did it. I actually reinvented myself. This is actually working. And the, the girl then asked me um, something odd. She said, so who is your favorite motocross rider? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know anything about motocross. She said, then, why are you wearing a shirt that is literally covered in motocross logos? I said, oh, um, uh, this shirt is very special because it belonged to my dead brother. My brother is still very much alive. <laughs> and as far as I know, he's never been interested in motocross. Well, needless to say, that relationship did not work out. And the next day, I went back to being nerdy, awkward, religious Derek. Have you ever been there? Have you ever woken up in the morning looked at yourself in the mirror and thought, nope, not enough. I need to be something else today. I need to be somebody better than what I am. And so that day, you reach out for something new, something else, a, 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 a new look, a, a new identity, a new attitude, a new career or purpose. Have you ever tried to be someone you're not? Or perhaps in the 21st century, it, it, it makes more sense for me to ask the question, have you ever actually tried to be yourself? Sometimes I wonder if we've all been trying to be someone else for so long that it's hard for us to even remember who we were to begin with. I think that is something of what Adam and Eve are going through in that story that, that Karen read for us today. I, and we're all familiar with the Adam and Eve story, and I don't know about you, but when I was raised in the church, I was always told that the story of Adam and Eve was a story about pride, right? Does that sound familiar? The, the, the serpent told them that if they eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, their eyes will be open and they will be what? Like God. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> like God. Um, and, 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 and the idea is, is that to, to desire to be like God can only be pride, right? It must have been their, their vanity, their arrogance, to lead them to believe that they could actually deign to be like Almighty God. And I remember my Sunday school teacher saying, oh, the, the gall of those two. To even imagine that the likeness of God could even be attainable. Why that, that some might say, is the worst possible sin, right? In fact, ever since St. Augustine, Christians have been calling pride the original sin. Uh, the sin from which all other sins emerge. It's pride, it's, it's vainglory, the sheer unadulterated arrogance of it. Except, weren't Adam and Eve created like God already? Yeah. I remember that. It, it, isn't it only two 
chapters earlier in the book of Genesis that we are told that God said, let us create humankind in our image, according to our likeness. So it says God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. So then, just to be clear, the serpent only offered Adam and Eve something that they already had. Friends, it's it's not that Adam and Eve had the audacity to imagine that they could be like God. It's that they forgot that they were created in God's image already. When the serpent offered them the fruit, he wasn't appealing to their vanity. He was appealing to their shame. He was appealing to their insecurity, to their inability or unwillingness to believe that they were just by virtue of being themselves already like God. The absolute tragedy of that moment that we call the fall, is not that Adam and Eve longed for something that was somehow inappropriate to them. It's that they fell for a tempter who offered them a deficient version of something they already had. And in the very next scene, we see the effect of it. We see Adam and Eve sowing fig leaves themselves. Remember that? To cover themselves up. And then, for some reason, Adam thinks he can run away from God. God catches him, obviously. And and God asks him why he's hiding. And, and, And Adam said, because I was naked, so I hid myself from you. And for the first time in the entire Bible, We see God react with something that is akin to frustration, akin to to anger, but it's not directed at Adam. God asks, who told you that you were naked? What a question that is. Who told you? That you were naked. You know, in a lot of ways, I think that's the question that that we in the church ought to be asking over and over again. The, The question that we should be asking ourselves. The question we should be asking one another. That we should be asking out in the world. Where people are constantly walking around in shame and guilt and self doubt. Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you lacked something? Who told you that you are deficient in some kind of way? That you are broken? That you need to clothe yourself? That you need to cover yourself with some anything other than me and my image to make you whole? Those leaves that Adam and Eve sow for themselves, they might as well be light blue leisure suits. They might as well be motocross t-shirts. They might as well be all the clothes and the cars and the status that we reach for every day to try to shore up who we are. All those things that we are constantly cobbling together to try to buttress our own identity. Friends, whenever we we imagine ourselves to be incomplete, when we imagine ourselves to be lacking something, when when we buy into the lie that we need something with which to drape ourselves, an identity with which to cover ourselves, to make us right or good or acceptable, that is when we participate 
in the sin of Adam and Eve. When we forget who we are, the glory by which we were first created. Christians love to throw around the term original sin. And the meaning of that term is very theological, it's very deep. But I almost never use it because I don't want anyone walking around thinking that sin is our origin. Amen? That, that it's not where we come from. Original sin can, can make it sound as if evil is the deepest part of who we are. Like sin is at the core of our being, and that is simply not true biblically, spiritually, or theologically. The core of our being is the image of God, the imago Dei, the the doctrine that says that we were created to be like God. To live like God, to be imitators of God, not in power, not in glory, not in strength, but in love, in relationship, in compassion. If there is an original sin in terms of a a first sin that, that starts the domino effect in our lives, it's not that we are unwilling to believe that that. It, it, it's not that, that we want to be like God, it's that we are too often unwilling to believe that God created us good already. True sin is not that we think too much of ourselves, it is that we think far too little. It's not that we give ourselves too much credit that we don't give ourselves enough. I remember when I was 18, I had this kind of crisis of religion, and I was, I was going to this great big evangelical church at the time, and everyone there seemed to be so good and so holy. And I just felt stuck in comparing myself to them and and, and in thinking that I just wasn't a good Christian, that there was something I was missing. And and, and somehow, while I was there, I got turned on to this book that said that every Christian (laughs) needed to sit for an hour every day and pray in tongues. That that if you do that, if you have the discipline to to sit alone and and, and pray in tongues every day for an hour, then you will connect with God. It said, then you will be blessed and transformed by God. If you do this thing and become this person, then you'll finally be worthy and you'll finally find what you've been looking for. So being 18, I tried it out. And I sat in my room and tried praying in tongues. No idea what I was doing. (laughs) And my mom came in, hearing this sound that she had never heard before, and she said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm praying. The book says if, if I pray like this, Then I'll have this this sort of breakthrough. And she looked at me and she said, Who told you that you needed to pray like that? Who told you? Friends, it's all the same temptation. If you eat the fruit, then you'll be like God. If you are the Son of God, then command these stones to turn to bread. If you fall down and worship me, then I will give you the nations of the world. If, then. That's what we call uh, transactional logic. 
the logic of exchange, the, the logic that all of our sin-sick societies are built upon. Essentially, your worth is dependent, according to them, upon what you do. Your value is dependent on what you become. Your being is dependent on your identity. But the logic of the church logic of the kingdom of God, the logic made apparent by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the logic of the gift. It's the logic of grace. The logic of incomprehensible gratuity. The idea that God has already given us everything that we need. God has already given us the identity that we need, the forgiveness that we need, the love. And, 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 and that's why we say Christ gave himself up for us while we were still sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. It's already there. The trick is to learn how to accept it. But the tragedy is that we keep looking elsewhere. That's why we fast for Lent, by the way. That's why people give up, uh, you know, chocolate or pop or fast from meat and dairy, whatever it is. It's not just to suffer, as if there is something inherently good about suffering. No, it's to remind ourselves in even a small way that we already have everything that we need. To learn how to take comfort in everything that God has already given to us. To know in a deeper way that we live not by bread alone. If you haven't chosen a fast, or if you're someone who, who typically doesn't do Lent, I would ask you just a simple question. When you are stressed or anxious or self-conscious or ashamed, what do you reach for in that moment? Fast from that. Because whatever that thing is, that's your leisure suit. <laughs> That's your fig leaf. Wherever you try to find your identity when you need to prove to yourself or to someone else that you are good, that you are worth something. If it's clothes, that, that outfit that makes you feel like you have it all together, leave it in the closet. Or maybe for you, it's work. Maybe it's being useful that, that, that helps you feel like you're important, that you are somebody. Then take some time off this Lent. And of course, we all like to identify with our political opinions, don't we? That's what makes us really feel like we belong. Like we're on the side of righteousness. If that's you, and try fasting from the news, from social media. Or some people, this is something I've only recently discovered. Some people, when they feel self-conscious, their first instinct is to actually reach out and help somebody else. And that sounds good, doesn't it? Except when that sort of thing comes from the void, when it comes from a place of insecurity, it becomes just another fig leaf. When we do those things not out of compassion, but because we need to be needed, well, that's when we gain our identity not from the image of God, but from the image that we cultivate for ourselves as being the one who helps. Some people need to fast, even from helping. 
You know, as a matter of fact, I, I had a professor once whose Lenten discipline was to eat chocolate-covered strawberries every day. Why? Because she knew that she found too much of her identity in her health and in her physical attractiveness. That was her fig leaf, her leisure suit. So for Lent, she left it behind. So you can do something like that, quite honestly. You can give up pop or sugar or whatever, or uh, you can do none of it. Lent, like everything we do, is only a tool. It's something we use to uncover, dig out, and scrape away the stony carapace that has grown over the one thing that we all need to remember, that we are children of God. Made in God's image, created to grow in God's likeness. And the truth is, my friends, we belong to God. We are God's already. And if we remember that, then we already have all we need. These words I offer to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Those who are able would please rise um, for our next hymn. Thank you. 
seated. We do have some prayer requests as we go before the throne of grace this morning. We want to remember to pray for our sister Joan Stamfly as she is receiving hospice care at her home. Larry Thompson is going through a new cancer therapy. And Dave, Feniger, Dave Feniger's brother, Mark, um, is waiting to have some more tests done. So we need to keep him and his family in our prayers. May the Lord be with you. Let us pray for the church and for the world. God of power and might, God of tender compassion, God of victory, God of sacrifice, God high above the heavens, God whispering from the depths of our hearts. In these moments of silence, we pour out our spirits before you. We give to you our joy and our thanks. We release to you our fear and our grief. We confess to you our sin and our confusion. And we ask to receive your forgiveness and your wisdom. O oh Lord, in your mercy, bless, O oh God, all those whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we might see and serve Christ in one another. O oh Lord, in your mercy, Bless our church and strengthen our commitment to her, that together we might be a faithful witness of your love. O Lord, in your mercy. Bless Ashlyn. Bless our community, our schools, our healers, our teachers, and all those who humbly serve one another. Bless this land, the people upon it, and all their leaders that we might lead lives of justice and peace. O oh Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the tumult of our world, remembering especially the war in Ukraine, and the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. O oh Lord, in your mercy. Bless the United Methodist Church as she struggles to be your servant in the world. O oh Lord, in your mercy. Soothe the sick, Lord Christ, and move us to their side. We remember especially Mark and Joan and Larry. O oh Lord, in your mercy. Comfort those who are dying, sanctify the souls of those who have departed, and bless those who mourn their passing. O Lord, in your mercy. We pray this morning not as timid souls, O Christ, but with all the boldness of the children of God, as you yourself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. If our ushers would come forward, we will receive the morning offering.
God, we do give you thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We thank you for our creation, our preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And so we ask that you would accept these gifts as but a small token of our appreciation back to you, that you would take them for the upbuilding of your kingdom, both here in Ashland and throughout the world, that the gates of hell might not prevail against it. And it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. And so much of our lives is built upon the assumption that we are somehow wrong, that we are broken, that we have a fatal flaw that must be covered over, that must be hidden. Friends, the hiding is the flaw, the shame, the inadequacy, the insecurity. That's the void. That's the law, the lie. 
the truth, brothers and sisters and siblings, is that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, not in the various and many images you can cook up for yourself, but in the very image of God. You, my friends, are God's. You belong to God. You come from God. And you are going to God. Let that be enough. May the love of God the Father, the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you and be with you now and always. Amen.